doesn't rip your head off, does it? No. But standard, they're like that. It's a bit like the R32 yeah. GTR. If you remember rally cars of the late 1990s, you won't forget the rivalry between the two standout all-wheel drive pocket rockets, Colin McRae's Subaru WRX and Tommy Mackinnon in the Mitsubishi Lancer Evo. Subaru won most of the manufacturer's championships in this period, but it was Tommy in the Evo 3, 4, 5 and 6 who won four WRC drivers' championships in a row. To commemorate this, Mitsubishi produced a tribute edition the very collectible Evo 6.5 TME, and you can't miss it, with Tommy Max stickers all over it. This is the car we're in today. Of all the 10 Evo generation cars, from 1992 right through to 2016, the Evo 6 is arguably the closest to the feeling of a real WRC rally car. It's got the active yaw control, which is a kind of torque vectoring, that came in with the Evo 4, but the later Evo 7 went to a slightly larger platform was a bit more comfortable, less raw, and added an active centre differential and more computers. But this car is really old school and analogue, and I think Mark's really going to enjoy it. Now a lot of collectors and rally enthusiasts of that period are firmly in either the blue camp or the red camp, but I heard that Peter, the owner of this Evo, also owned the rarest of the rare collectible rally cars, a Subaru WRX 22B one of only five that Subaru brought to Australia of the 400 ever made, almost all of which are now sitting in collections. But Peter used his for years as a daily driver. I did have a Subaru. I was one of the uh, lucky Australians to get one of the five Aussie delivered cars. Uh, two actually stayed with uh, dealers and three went to private, uh, private people. So I got one at the time, was never to be registered, but we negotiated with Subaru Australia, uh, paid a, a silly amount of money, uh, compliance. It was uh, my road car. I uh, did 45,000 Ks in it and uh, one of my worst decisions was to actually sell it but uh, there's always other chocolates in the box and through the sale of that I was able to move on to other things but uh, yeah it was a, a great car, enjoyed it immensely. What do you think that car would be worth these days? Well there's only been one other uh, Aussie delivered car uh, put to the market recently. It was advertised for $800,000 and hasn't been sold. Uh, but. You know, realistically, uh, Australian delivered car, five or six hundred thousand, I guess. Holy smoke. Yeah. I, I don't get bitter or twisted because, you know, you have other wins in other areas or other cars, and uh, I just, you know, feel privileged that I was able to, you know, experience it. Um, took it a, a few times to uh, Eastern Creek, mostly uh, on sort of drive days or exhibition days. Took passengers around. Uh, I remember having it unintentionally sideways in turn one. Um, Fortunately, I went back to the pits because the three passengers, when I got back into the pits and looked at their faces, I think they were all about to throw up. So it was uh, fortuitous to go back, but an exceptional no understeer, uh, which is rare for a four wheel drive car. Uh, but, you know, we should talk about this rather than Subaru, I guess. Yeah. Before we let Mark loose on the roads with it. Yeah. Um, Tell me about like modifications and stuff. And... Well, it's it's uh, uh, the nice thing is that um, this is pretty standard. It's got an exhaust which was put on in Japan. Uh, other than that, it's had a few replacement bits. It's got a a, a new um, intercooler. Essentially, it's a pretty standard car, uh, which are getting harder to find because they're they're very popular for modification. You can get enormous horsepower uh, reliably um, out of these engines. So it should go pretty much like a standard R32 GTR of the same sort of era, shouldn't it? Um, um, although that's a much earlier car. The beauty about this is uh, they weigh, uh, from memory, 1280 kilos, uh, so substantially lighter than the R32. They're much more nimble and uh, chuckable, uh, and I dare say uh, predictable on the limit compared to a standard R32. Um, obviously, R32 was ultimately, you know, once developed more suitable for the track, these are suitable for tight, twisty and or dirt roads. Uh, so hard to compare, but personally, uh, I would in, I, I find more enjoyment driving this than, than an R32. I like both, but probably out of the, that era of, of JDM, uh, NSX is number one, followed closely by this, uh, number two. And you have to qualify that by the, the, the roads you're driving on, I guess. Uh, tight, twisty roads, this is number one, flowing, Fast roads, NSX, I'd say number one, mm. that personal opinion. What sort of power do they put out? Uh, again, uh, quoted as 276, but I'd say this is no question over 300. Um, as a guesstimate, maybe 320. And 
Uh, don't like to talk about values, but I still think these are a performance ba a bargain, even though they've gone up quite substantially. Um, still excellent value for money. And, and really performance-wise, there are some difference in characteristics between, say, the 22B and this, but um, I think there's pluses and minuses, and this comes out very favourably in terms of uh, performance uh, at a fraction of the price. 22B at five or 600 grand, who's got to drive that as an everyday car? This one, you can drive it as an everyday car. No, no drama at all. I remember the first time I drove one of these, you know, back in the late 90s, and it, and it was probably at Iron Park here in Sydney on the racetrack, and it was just sort of mind-blowing, the performance you could get out of them. And I keep looking for sixth gear. It's been a while since I've driven a five-speed manual. Nice little gearbox, actually. Really, really, it just feels strong. Obviously, these cars are very strong. Yeah. And unusual colour. They're normally red, aren't they? Yeah, I think there's uh, not that many of this blue. It's, it's a really nice colour. It just works really well. The rivalry with the Subaru WRX, of course. You're in one camp or the other. What camp are you in? Are you uh, I'll let you know after I've driven this a little bit longer. Okay. But you had a Subaru, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I had a WRX years, years ago. About when this car was out, about 1999, one of the, uh, one of the early ones, and uh, it was a bit modified. It was a really fun car for the time. Mm. I mean, they were, they were groundbreaking cars. When these were out, late 90s, they were just, the, the performance level was staggering. Mm. And okay, today we're, we're, we're used to what we have in modern cars. It's another level again, but very clever uh, your sensing devices in this car, and it takes me back to uh, you know, to the 90s, jumping one of those, just the whole the interior. It's like a trip uh, trip down memory lane. Um, Reminds but, me of my GTR. Yeah. So it's the same and the same kind of seats. This era, yeah, all feels the same. Yeah. Skinny little steering wheel, you know. Like that's one thing, you know. I don't like these skinny steering wheels, but it's just of the era. Yep. Um, and it hasn't got 15 boost gauges and it hasn't got stuff all that, all that stuff. time. Yeah, it's just yeah. standard. Yeah, absolutely. It's got 100,000 Ks on it, and we've managed to avoid people doing all the things that they do to it, which yeah. are fine, but that's its value, the fact that it is standard. The ride's really good, it's not too harsh, yeah. hasn't been stuffed around with, and the vision out the front is fantastic. Well, the vision out the back, it looks like there's a blue van yeah, following yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely. Keep looking in the mirror, don't you? Even though there's a lot going on, it feels very mechanical and almost analog in some ways. It's not one of those cars, you know, even like the GTR that we drove recently, the R35, there's a lot of computer stuff happening there, right? Decent torque, just 3,000 revs in fifth gear there. Yeah. But it still pulls pretty well, doesn't it? And again, you know, the, like I said, the power steering is super light, but it actually feels really good. Like, I can really feel the front end of the car, even though it is very light. Okay. Good. How does she pull? what it's got it puts to the ground well doesn't it you get around a nice you know, constant radius corner like this bit on the throttle that's pretty impressive isn't it yep this puts the power down yeah, so it's, well it's nowhere near its limit there but it's you know it's an interesting comparison looking at the r35 that we drove just only a few weeks ago mm. much newer car of course bigger heavier the whole thing but this feels half the size of that it does doesn't it yeah it's so, it's so nimble yeah it's a go-kart it's fast enough or a nice sticky yokohama a008s very good tire a little bit soft so they're probably going to wear fast yeah. but but as a road car with our limits 80 k's here it just doesn't make any sense to make this car go any faster. Yeah. And actually the seat doesn't have any adjustment, it's just got backrest and it's quite good. The bolsters yeah. are good and the back support's good. But it'd be nice if I could tilt it and yeah. actually get a little bit more thigh support. Whoa! Now it's getting jiggly. Headlights on. Much better. Yeah. That was too bumpy before. Just, just that slightly better road makes quite a difference, doesn't it? It really does need a smooth road, doesn't it? But it's so good. Oh. Like how good is the traction through there? <laughs> That's actually really fun. Yeah, fabulous, Mark. Very good. Yeah. That's 
but yeah. it, it just does everything right. I mean, yeah. and you know, I've been so talking easy. about the steering being a little bit too lightish, but when you get into a bit of road like that, you appreciate what that is like. It really talks to you. You can feel the front tyre. Um, it's not over boosted. It just it just does everything right. corners where this car's perfect. 180 degree hairpin, bit of a damp road. Well, there's not a hint of understeer there, is there? It just pulls out of there so well. over on how many there are in Dubai in Australia and what they're worth, here's Stu. The early Evo 2, 3 and 4 started around 40k, but they're a bit thin on the ground, there aren't many to be found. But there are quite a few Evo 5s and 6s, and they also start around the same price, high 30s. It's also worth noting that the Evo 6 had significant improvements over the Evo 5 in terms of cooling and engine durability, with a larger intercooler, larger oil cooler, new pistons, that kind of thing. And even though prices are climbing, you heard Peter say that he thinks the Evo 6 Tommy Mackinan edition is still a bargain and collectible. But there's definitely a price premium to be paid for the Tommy Mac, with the cheapest asking around $65,000 and heading up to a lofty $180,000. But you'll have plenty to choose from though, at least a dozen for sale right now of each of those types. So maybe the base Evo 6 is the one I'd go for. Although it didn't get the flashy Tommy bits, that chunky front bumper, all those decals, the embossed Recaro seats, the sexy Momo leather wheel, the gorgeous 17-inch white Enki wheels, a faster spooling titanium turbine wheel, the strut braces, the quicker rack at 2.7 turns lock to lock, and it was lowered, and the signature red colour which was only available on this car. Hmm, that's quite a lot I guess. But whether you go for the base model or the TME, there's still plenty to choose from. I'll leave it up to you. You might also be interested in a Subaru WRX that's hard to say, STI of the same period, which are similarly priced and some of them even cheaper. Just looking at STIs of the same period, 1999 to 2000, there are about 30 for sale in Australia, ranging from 26,000 to 130,000. So if you can tolerate that flat four Subaru chugga chugga sound, that's a good option for a car that drives very similarly. Okay, so when the light goes green, we've got the guys here, full launch, Yeah, yeah. ping limiter, 40k zone. Dump it. Mitsubishi Motor Stereo. And it's pretty ordinary. You don't buy one of those cars for the stereo, do you? Sure. No, you don't. Probably not the right road for almost any car. It's, I think this is more fun to drive than the R35 GTR. Really? Yeah. Why don't we go and ask Stu to tell us about the specs of this car? He will know all we need to know about this. He car. does. Over to you, Stu. Whoa, easy, Tiger. I'm not ready yet. Thanks for just dumping me in it. You're welcome. All right, all right. Anyway, why are you always in the passenger seat? Can you even drive? Don't patronise me. All right, all right, there they are. Why don't I just stick them right over your face like this? Yeah, we'll be like that then. Let's talk power. Right up to the Evo 8, Mitsubishi claimed, like Subaru did, their cars made no more than the gentleman's agreement, 276 horsepower. But everyone knows this is conservative, and it's also very easy to tune them to big horsepower. And that was tempting to people. It's very easy to get carried away once you start cranking up the boost. For example, here in Sydney, the Tilton Evo Time Attack car uses the same 4G63 block, just stroked out to 2.2 litres, but it produces no less than 1,000 horsepower at 40 pounds of boost. So these motors are basically very, very strong. I thought, though, that for blasting around on public roads, this car, the power was perfectly adequate, with plenty of torque. It really didn't need any more. Look, any Evo is a desirable car, but the Evo 6 seems to be in a sweet spot for my thinking. 
As a rally navigator myself, from my spot sitting in the passenger seat beside Mark, it felt like it had a real connection to a proper tarmac rally car. So what's the verdict? It does quite well on our score. Performance, good. Yeah. Presentation, yeah, nah, it's not, it's a, it's a little Japanese four-door yeah. sedan with some plastic on it. Yep. It needs smooth road. And Doesn't. when it gets some smooth road, it loves it. Yep. Practicality. Great. Entirely practical, isn't it? Yeah. Heaps of luggage space in the back. Yeah. Reasonably economical. Great vision. Very safe. Yep. Super practical. Yeah, but I've really enjoyed driving this car, Stuart. It's, it's a car that probably doesn't necessarily appear on my list of cars that I want to have out there. Mm. However, it's a really enjoyable car and so much fun. And it's a really nimble feeling car. Mm. But Peter, thanks again. We really do appreciate the trust that you've put in us uh, to use your wonderful cars and um, yeah, we're looking forward to doing more of them. Thanks mate. A really fun car for the weekend and a totally practical car day to day. Why not? What's wrong with it? Criticisms? Well there's one thing you just can't get away from. Its styling is so totally over the top with that ridiculously huge wing and busy front splitter, not to mention all the stickers. So that's a love it or hate it thing. Totally up to you on that one. And the sound it makes isn't particularly soulful. A pleasant drum when you're cruising and purposeful on the boil, but it's not really a musical motor. But then again, nor is a WRX. So if you can stand the styling, time for you to go shopping. So that's the Evo 6.5 Tommy Mackinnon edition. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to Peter for the loan of his fabulous car. And thank you to Mark for driving. See you next time. So this stage, let's do a little shout out to Alex Nemirovsky in Oregon, who's a big fan of the channel. So hi, Alex. Um, I imagine these roads are quite like the ones you've got on the other side of the world there. We'll yeah. get over there one day and uh, drive some of your cars. Thanks for supporting the channel. Yeah, appreciate we it. Appreciate it. If ever you get out here, this is a nice bit of road.